Chastise as far as I'm aware. Well, it's ten thirty on my watch. It's ten twenty-seven on, on the clock in the room, and it's ten thirty-one on our indicators here. So we'll make a start. Uh, I know everybody's getting settled in. Seem to be in a merry mood as well, which is good. It's good to see. Uh, let's see. So first item on the agenda is uh, said around the apologies without me looking at it. I've not got myself in front of me yet. You're getting set up, and it is. So uh, over to you, Claire. Okay. Thank you, Chair. We've got ten members present this morning. Two apologies from. Councillors Howie and Young, uh, two members not present, being Councillor Drybrook and Councillor Thompson. Councillor Thompson's coming, isn't he? He's, he's in the building, certainly, and he's coming. We spoke to him earlier. So he's on his way. Not so sure about Councillor Drybrook, you mentioned. So I think the process is if, if uh, Archie doesn't turn up, his apologies will go in. Any declarations of interest? Yes. Councillor Maitland, Jean. I, I do. Um, could I declare an interest, please, in item 6, Appendix 4, uh, which is the um, grants progress e EU leader, yes. Um, I know in a personal capacity one of the developers of the project, Rusco Studios. So I'll absent myself for item 4. Okay, so you will leave the room, you say? Yes. Right, okay, thank you for that, Jean. Anybody else got any particular... Declarations of interest? No, we've noticed Councillor Thompson has now entered the meeting. He's present. Okay, item number three is minute of the previous meeting of the 25th of June. So those who are present, can I move that as being an accurate minute? Uh, any dissenting voices? We haven't got any. Do we need a seconder for that? I don't think we do, do we? Do we, do we? No, fine. Uh, we've got a moving a seconder. So, uh, Jane and myself. Thank you. Uh, so the next minute for approval is 24th September. Again, I think all of us were here. It's for no, it's been the full council. I take it then. Yep, been the full council. And agreed there. So item number five, uh, we've noted that nobody's got any particular points in which to raise is the delegation to the audit, risk, and Scrut scrutiny committee. So in order to try and do as much scrutinising as we possibly can, I wonder the report author for this is that yourself, Liz? Yeah, we're going to look in. It's clear. So it is. That's right. Just that earlier. So clear. Have you got anything to? Oh. I don't know that, I'll come back to it. It's something I meant to say in a minute. I don't know that, I'll get back to that at a different point. Rushing too hard. Claire, have you got anything you want to uh, say about nothing this? Nothing to add, Chair. It's just a, a procedural report following the, the um, agreement of the new scheme with Bicycle Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, its purpose of this report is to provide information on the delegation of this committee as agreed at full council. As Claire has just outlined, the uh, I did have a second recommendation I was going to add to this. I'll read it out, but I think maybe get clarity, uh, clarity from Liz after that. So what I was thinking, because of the, the, it's quite a heavy delegation, if, if you notice, especially for the new members, we've got a big delegation because the two committees came together and even looking at the four committee cycles per year, maybe we'll touch on that later on. Uh, maybe even have a, another item of business, just depending on how, how the, uh, the time we're taking as we go through. Uh, may call it an extra item just to discuss that particular point, but what, what I was going to say was to, to as, a, as a second recommend, recommendation, was to receive a report to the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee outlining the reports presented up to date since May 2017 and how they help fulfil the authority that is delegated to this committee. So, but Liz, I think there, yeah. there, there may be a different way in which to cover that. It may well be covered. Anyway. That's right. And I think just in your remit at 5611, which is in page 18 of your papers, that you do have a requirement to produce an annual report on the work of this committee. So one of the things that we've programmed into your um, plan for next year is we'll discuss at a workshop exactly how we want to do that, but clearly looking at the reports that you've had, what's happened as a result of your recommendations would be part of looking at the, the annual report and the performance of this committee. So I think that's a very helpful suggestion there that we'll build in to the fulfilment of that part of your remit going forward. So, so I suppose the point I was raising, I think it's appropriate what Lizzie said as, as an option forward, unless anybody's thinking otherwise, but we have got a heavy delegation, a very low frequency of meetings, and ultimately, I think when we do review that and, and, self, and have a reflection on it, we'll see that we haven't, as a, as, a, as a committee, we haven't covered the bases that we should have been covering over since May 17. We haven't even had an annual report back to ourselves to look at that. So. We haven't even looked at it inwardly, but going back to the points we've made previously, it's been difficult with the volume of work we've had and the frequencies of meetings that have been scheduled. That's why we may consider another item of business, looking at that. 
particular point, the frequency of meetings, because the next one, some of them will be looking at a scrutiny review, so we take that forward. There's a three month process, three meeting cycle process. So if you take them to the nth degree, you're talking again, up to 18 month cycle to look at something, consider it, go through that process before you get back to full council, which is far, far too slow as far as I'm concerned. So if it is okay with recommendation two, since we're asked to note the audit and risk the delegation, are we okay with that? Yep, excellent, thank you. Item number. Uh, six is on internal audit reviews. I will say before they come up, we've got Richard coming up here today to talk to these. Kevin's in the background for security. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I thoroughly enjoyed reading these. I thought it was a clear theme uh, through them all. I thought that the leader, the, the last one, item four, without uh, touching on that, so, uh, we'll maybe take them one at a time as, as a process. But I did think there was a clear theme across them all in regards to behaviours and conduct within the council, really, and how, how, how they apply. So, but I did actually enjoy reading them. So. I wonder, Richard, have you got anything you want to add or even say about about the your your internal uh, audit reviews? Not particularly. I'm very happy to take questions on any report. So what we'll do, we'll take one at a time. Well, if if everybody's happy with that, we've got four: the main financial systems, the payroll, the same again as per the second one, which is pensions. Then it goes on to the departmental financial systems. And that's the use of purchase cards. Player, then ultimately the, the one that Jane alluded to earlier, the leader programme. So the first one is the main financial payroll, that's in Appendix 1. I've got loads of wee notes in that, but I'll look for members to come in first. Or maybe, I've not got any rush of hands as of yet, but I, what I did notice then is that there's a theme I maybe pick up on a couple of points. Uh, so there's um, 4.6, I picked up a new start. Standard uh, new start notification forms are being used to input uh, a new employee. Checks are made to the central records of authorised signatories to ensure the person signing the new start uh, form is on the list, but physical signatories are not being checked. That is a risk that management have, have, have accepted. We note that at the time of the audit, the physical signatory was not up to date. So, I mean, let's just point that out. It, it's, it's obviously... Was it a Clara, Clara? Was it no? But these, these teams go right through these, this report and others, so maybe touch them. So I wonder, Richard, have you got any, anything to say on that, these particular points in particular? I suppose, probably to outline my thoughts as I read through these. As I'm reading through, I'm thinking, okay, we've got protocols and policies in place that we should be adhering to, but there's a very lackadaisical approach to actually uh, implement these. Uh, implement these He's taking them seriously. Now, so at a low level, you could think, well, that's absolutely fine. That can, okay, it's not overly, the risk's not too high, it's not overly serious. But actually, leadership normally comes to the top down. So what you find is happening in the low level is happening at the top. And we have got a report coming to full council that outlines similar behaviours at a much higher level, which will not get into any detail at all. So to me, there seems to be a theme across the council where actually we're policy and procedures that are made at this level, at committee level, in full council, but actually, why... When it comes to the staff, not all of them, but some of them think, well, why should we actually take any notice of them? So, Richard, I don't know if you've got any comments. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I did check with Pain Employment Services and the signature list is now up to date. This has obviously been several months since the audit was actually done. Um, the other mitigating factor, in a way, is that many of the signatures will be routinely recognised by staff who've been in post for a very long time. But you're right, it would be good practice to check signatories for anyone they're in doubt. Stephen. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, it, I suppose um, I, this is the first one of these types of reports that I've really sort of been able to uh, look into, but um, so I wasn't really sure where to focus my uh, attention the strongest, if you like. But there's a few things that popped up. A lot of it did seem to be to do with, okay, 4.13 on page 25. Uh, it talks about um, not no you know cases where there's no evidence of budgetary approval, for example, um, and it gives a couple of examples. Obviously, you know th these are samples, and that may only be a couple of cases in each time. But it, it is a wee bit of a concern that uh, there's nothing to prevent that going. F you know, uh, like if you're doing things online now, it's like tick the box to ensure you've got the right thing, or you can't go any further. Now it just seems like somebody could, if they were so minded, just type it in. You know, so I, I sort of think, well, I don't know how assured I am by that in terms of like the controls that are in place to prevent unauthorized things happening. 
um, because they clearly have happened. Now, the good good practice seems to be relying on the fact that yeah, the cult is very much reliant on what the culture and training in, uh, of that particular department might be. But if given that that could vary, I would want the assurance that there's actually a control mechanism in place that would actually stop things that shouldn't happen. Um, that might be. So I don't know if that's a management issue or if it's like in the management needs we look at or something or you know I, I really don't know so because I don't really know how to read this. And there's a few other points as well uh, in the same report. I'm sure other members will pick up the MITTS files. This is 4.26, 4.27, etc. Um, you know, uh, people who weren't approved to sign were signing stuff. Um, some weren't signed. Um, so. You, it's either important and you should do it and you have to do it and it's mandatory, or it's like, well, you ought to, but if you didn't, well, it's fine. You know, so it does, I know what you're saying by the lackadaisical there, so I can see that that could be a concern. But again, I don't know how to balance that in terms of the sa sample size, in terms of how reflective it is. It, obviously, if you find that something happens, it may not mean that that characterises the way things work. Do you know what I mean? So, um, And the, the further thing, just on these reports, actions and recommendations that arise from the reports, there's a wee bit at the very end, I presume that's that's a summary of all the actions that are meant to take place. Uh, so on page, um, sorry, sorry for pulling you about like this, uh, on page uh, 30 and 31, uh, yeah, so it talks about any actions need to be taken. Now, I don't know if that only relates to a couple of the it does mention 42426, but it doesn't touch on 413, so that's evidently not sufficient to reach an action. So I'm not really sure how to follow the line of logic as to what, what merits an action to be carried forward and what's just kind of, yeah, well, we'll just take that as part of the part of the thing. So it's more just to understand maybe how best to read the reports. Um, so it's a kind of a, there's a few things wrapped up in that, Chair. Thanks for your indulgence. Oh. And I will ask Richard to come back with, with comments, but I mean, that's the exact same theme as I was picking up on. When it comes to the conclusions, that's what I referred to earlier. When it comes to the actual, the fourth appendix, there's a much stronger action point behind it. And I felt so, and it felt, what it felt very much was like, okay, the three in house, okay, we, we see what you're saying, we spoke to the officers, they accept what we're saying. But that's when it comes to the actions, okay, come back to the, the, the tick box exercise, so to speak. Okay, we hear what you're saying, but it's absolutely low risk. We'll treat this as guidance rather than protocol. That's how it came across to me. And some of the coming for the construction trade was we often, as an apprentice, when you start to say, listen, you've got to get your foundations right. If we didn't get these foundations right, we'll build this house and it'll collapse in 20 years' time. Or you'll see cracks. The cracks will start to appear. You've got to come back and constantly repair. And that's what this is about, getting the foundations right. And I think this is, so if we get it right at the bottom end, we're not going to get it right at the top. And that's what Stephen's just outlined is exactly the points I was picking up. So when it comes to that, so your response, your conclusions, okay, from an in, internal auditor's point of view, we do accept, they accept it maybe is low level, but actually what are the actions we've got to bring this back into order? So so that, that's maybe a point I'm picking up, uh, picking up just to try and support Stephen, uh, and I know Malcolm's got some points, but I'll let you come back and uh, respond to that first, Richard, and I'll bring Malcolm in. Thank you, Chair. I mean, the first point is, within each case, there is mitigating control. So, for example, the budget you control one, will be supported by the revenue budgeting process. That's not to say the control should be in place. We put a control in place which should be followed. But what I'm taking from the Chair's comments and others' comments is you would like a more robust action plan in some of our internal audit reports, which makes clearer actions. And that's something we can address for the future in terms of report style. It's very healthy. Malcolm, then I'll come back in. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's uh, one of my own personal bugbears about manual entries, you know, whether it be journal entries or whatever. And I see in 4.3 it was manual adjustments to the payroll. Now the thing I find a wee bit surprising about this is that they accept that there's a risk. If there was an inappropriate adjustment made, we keep no paperwork uh, to arrive at how this came about or to, to justify it. Now that's going to make life very difficult if you want to go back and uh, find out what any kind of problems been. Maybe in this case problems are small, it's maybe not a lot of money, but that doesn't mean that in the future it isn't going to be like that. So I think we really need to have some evidence here because in the previous one, 4.29, again you're on about input of data from spreadsheets 
and that's fine. We keep the spreadsheet, so we've got a paper trail. We've got an audit trail for that, and I think we should do exactly the same with manual entries. In fact, manual entries, to me, would be very important because there is an element, there is a huge risk there of, uh, of uh, potential problems with that. Now, the next thing is, it comes back onto what Stephen said and the chair said exactly. We've got, you know, management are supportive of the conclusions. Well, you know what, that's really nice that they're supportive. But I would like to find out when something's going to be done about it. I would like to have confirmation that action has been taken. It's all very well being supportive, but I think really what we're needing is we're needing results to come from this and we're needing to be given evidence that improvement has been made. I'd like to come back to you on section 4.30, if I may, to start with. I think the report may not have been clearly, there may have been a bit of misunderstanding in the way the report was written in that school. What we were actually referring to is the method of checking, and that is they are checking the paperwork that is being processed. So there is an audit trail for the paperwork that should be there. What we're saying is that if somebody was deliberately trying to put in a false transaction, they would obviously not create an audit trail. They would not create any paper. And that theme's been referred to elsewhere in the report, for example, when you start. To give a simple example, if you're going to put a ghost employee onto the payroll, you're not going to have a paper trail. So what we're suggesting as part of this is that you, when you do checking, you don't check the paperwork. You check everybody that's just joined the payroll to see if there is paperwork. So it's, what we're asking for is a different way of checking. But for legitimate ones, there will be an audit trail. We're not saying that paperwork isn't there for the genuine ones. Uh, that's, that's fine. It was the illegitimate ones were the ones that I was concerned about. That was the area of weakness that I was concerned about. Richard, I wonder, I wonder if you could just expand. I've, we spoke at a, at a group level just on what a ghost employee is. Get an understanding of what that is. I mean, I've got an understanding in my mind what that is, but I just wonder if you could expand what that means. Uh, reflecting back to in the late 80s, I remember it was an organisation where uh, somebody was approaching, listen, we are creating a job post, you'll be in that job, it wasn't to me, it was somebody else, I was still serving my time at that point, but you, you, you'll you be getting that job, you'll never have to turn up and we're sharing the wages. So that was my understanding of a ghost employee. Large organisations, it does happen, so it's the protections, but just when you've touched on it, it's the protections that we have in place, I suppose, to make sure that we're covering those bases. And I think Malcolm's kind of, that's what he's alluding to, in one sense. In theoretical terms, the ghost employee is just that. It is someone who was put onto the payroll without actually, may not, without actually existing. There is no evidence that they exist and the, within the council, and there are a number of mitigating controls that we have in place. To refer to them, apart from the budgetary control, which is not always effective, one of the purposes of the establishment control checks that have been done is to ask managers to sign on a regular basis to say, yes, these employees are in my department, they do turn up for work, they should be charged to it, and that's one of the key controls to prevent it. That in addition to the checks that are taking place when we have new starters in place. No, thanks Richard, thank you for, for knowledge. Stephen? Yep. Yeah, so just on the same point, so, and, and just for assurance, but so effectively, if there's no paperwork that exists for an employee that's on the system, then they're, they're a ghost employee. If the employee doesn't exist. <laughs> so I think there is cases where that's like what you're saying, so there is not paperwork to back it up, but they are an employee, but the paperwork hasn't been carried out. But in real terms, I think the definition of a ghost employee, correct me if I'm wrong, is the circumstances where it is there's an employee registered, there's money being paid, but nobody else exists. It is a fake person. It's for financial corrupted, corruptive benefit. Yeah, so I, th I think it was just, the, the check seemed to be that if you wanted to add a ghost employee, there wouldn't be any paperwork. So for every employee that there is, there will be paperwork. So if you discover an employee where there's no paperwork, they shouldn't be on the system. By logical, yeah, yeah. I, agree with that. I mean, that, that would be a red flag straight away. So, okay, here's a potential risk here. It's a ghost employee. Let's that's a physically go and see. It's not an electronic thing you could do. Aye. That'd be my understanding. Richard? You will note in section 4.9 that in, when we checked a random sample of new starts, we were initially unable to find the paperwork for one employee because it had been scanned into the wrong folder within W2. 
and it's now, now subsequently been found and I've checked it. And on that particular paragraph, some of the language, it, it appears to be, and appears to be, a couple of times you've, you've wrote that, and I, to me that, it does appear to be, it, that's, it's very, very light language, but now you've come back and said, okay, it doesn't appear to be, you've actually confirmed it is actually the case, that that's, that's okay, you've been through that process, and you've had the reassurances that that's okay. But when I was reading these reports, there's a lot of that type of language, Richard, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it really raised alarms for me. Things appear to be the case, so is there absolutely a problem with an internal audit, no, kind of, no fulfilling their duties? But clearly you have been, you have went back and you have checked. So, uh, Malcolm, and then Jork. That was the second part of the, the question, is when we're getting evidence that improvement action has been taken. Sorry, Malcolm, I was getting a number of names out of there. Sorry. What did you say? Are you, are you ready now? <laughs> no, I was just saying the second part about when we're going to get evidence of improvement action taken. That was all. Uh, well, I'm wondering if we can cover that after the, after the four, even the three, because I think it's a theme that we'll have to come back and say, OK, this is how we'll, we'll look at these. If we're looking at these, I think the theme goes across the three, we'll come back to that point. Malcolm, so it's actually comes for Campbell first. Then your cell job. Sorry about that. Sorry, John, let me see. And then Jane, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've just got a couple of points. I'll start with the Darth Laddie one. Why have we got five different payrolls? You know, is there scope in the future that we could maybe slim that down? I know that we may need more than one. Uh, the second point I was going to raise is uh, under the overpayments, which is covered in page 28, 29, 4.38. Uh, there's currently 11 ongoing deductions from employees of uh, seven of these uh, being recovered over less than a year and the other two over two years. Uh, the question I want to uh, raise with that one is uh, if, if you know an employee finds that they're being overpaid, I mean, is it a, an agreement with them to see how much they can afford to repay the, the overpayments Absolutely. over a set period, you know? Like, like there's two over two years, but one less than a year, or seven less than a year, rather. I just wanted to know, is, that, is the facility there for employees to negotiate how long a period that they can have to pay that back? The, thank you. The standard practice within paying employment services is for the overpayment to be recovered over the period for which it was overpaid. So if an employee was, was was to receive additional pay over three months, the overpayment would be recovered over three months. However, when they are sent a letter to advise them of the overpayment, they are also advised that if this will cause undue financial hardship, they can write to the council to ask for a longer payment period. Um, in terms of the overall period for which it should be done, the, the normal practice with all debtors is for no payment should be more than two years. And I note there are a couple of cases which are longer than that, which are historic cases. And the only thing I would say is that Paul Garrett is now getting more actively involved in payroll overpayments to consider these for the future. So those controls will be tightened up for longer pay repayment. I remember being act actively involved in one. Sorry, John, are you coming back? Yeah, uh, my, my daft laddie question about the, why have we got five different payrolls? That's a more difficult one for me to answer. I, can only, I, I think the answer is simply we've got very, five very different groups of people involved. First of all, we've got teachers who are paid on a different cycle to local government employees. We've also got pensioners who are paid separately. I'm not sure the other two, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, so, I, I suppose that'll, uh, forget now, is it economy and resources of finance, procurement transformation, we'll, we'll overlook that and we'll forget what one it is, but uh, come back to it. I did have, have, a, have a help an employee once in regards to overpayment and it was extended beyond the time that had been paid within that and it was quite a difficult, but hardship was a clear part of that, that, that whole thing, so it was extended in that particular case. Uh, I felt that. So we've got Councillor McKee and Jane. I think uh, we're doing a lot of criticising, I think rightly so, 
for an overpayment taking 12 years to five up, quite an issue. And I think we, we've got to recognise that to a certain extent we are to blame because we're reducing staff all the time. The big issue as far as, our, as I'm concerned is what training are we giving to these staff? Are we sure, are we sure that they are fully trained in what they are asked to do? Because uh, you'll have heard this right first time every time. And that's the standard we should be working to, especially finances like this. There's just no, no excuse for it. And just as, as I say, recognising the, the difficulty staff have at times, new staff coming in and having to train them up and all that sort of thing. It's no, it's no easy, but I think the concentration should be on getting everything sorted out and just accepting an error as being an error. That's not acceptable. I think we've got to go back and why was that error made and ensure it's not made again. So I would look at the standard being right first time every time and appreciate where you are with the changes in staff and all that sort of thing. But I think we've got to set a standard and try and work there. I think that's a very good point. I think, Jock, Dave, before I bring Jane in. So I, I, I wonder, as part of your internal review, did you consider the level of training that the staff had at that point? Were they, were they being trained up to the appropriate level? Or do you think, was, was there even an outcome to say, OK, they weren't and they should have been? I just wonder, because I think it is an important point. Are we, are we supporting the staff to the proper level, I suppose? It's easier to speak for the Pay and Employment Service, the central function, rather than the departmental level. Certainly the Pay and Employment Services have got a low turnover of staff, which reduces the risk of error because they are experienced staff. Um, we haven't specifically looked at the training they received for this particular audit, no. Um, no, thank you. That's something for us to consider. Absolutely is, because if the level of support if, if we as the council aren't actually given the, the appropriate level of support, that's a weakness from our point of view. Yeah. Joke. And if the staff have been there a while and they have had sufficient training, that needs to be addressed, without a doubt. And that will reduce the... You've got the... We have an identified weakness in the processing of mixed input by services. Financial Code 1 sets out the requirements. We will observe inputters and system authorizers need to be more diligent. Now, what's caused that? What's caused the diligence? Are they, are they lacking in experience or support or, or training or whatever? And these, these things need to be addressed. And I would hope we would get a report. I don't know if it's the next meeting. Is it quarterly we meet? I think but we'll we talk about that at the end, Jock. So I think well, April we'll April's get, the next one scheduled, but we'll maybe talk about that at the end in a, get, another item. And maybe we're getting a report two. on the process of training and that sort of thing. Thanks, Chair. I suppose uh, Councillor Johnson touching the point is uh, how do we actually, if we're looking at this and we think the conclusions on it maybe aren't strong enough, maybe, maybe we need to be built up, we'll cover that after the third one, then we'll allow Jane to leave the meeting uh, so we can talk about the leader programme. So, Jane. Thank you. Um, I, I was going to ask about temporary input. Um, it's the paragraphs from 421 to 432. Um, is it possible? Is it possible for overtime to be paid that hasn't been worked? Um, I, I'm looking at the. Um, paragraph which suggests now it's not necessarily overtime but um, it might be extra extra hours um, where six of the um, payments were not signed and, and there is a suggestion that the services exactly what other members have been saying that the services are not actually following um, process, agreed process um, so that's the first question. Would it be possible to pay overtime that had not actually been worked? And the second question, um, if that's within the scope of this audit, and the second question is the, the sample sizes. I mean, do you think that arguably 26 in 31 timesheets not signed? Is, is, I mean, is that, that's really quite a large number. 
in terms of the sample. I mean, if they were all like that, that wouldn't be very good news. I don't think. Thank you. Certainly, in that particular section, yes, it is a concern to us that that control is not being followed within terms of the MITS input. And yes, if a control is not being followed, it is possible that overtime could be paid that's not being worked in the same way that it's possible that if a manager authorizes something, we take the authorization on trust that they, that they were authorizing to say the work has been done. In terms of the overall sample size, I wish it is a balance between the resources required and the level of the samples that we do. In terms of this particular one, we've actually got a conclusion from the sample of 30, which is useful. Do you that, Jim? Well, I mean, what, what do we take from that? If, if six in 30 or 31 are wrong, um, I mean, does that say we actually be, ought to be doing some more work? Or does it not? I wonder if, if that's come back to the point that Malcolm brought up earlier and has been brought up since, I'll bring in a minute, Katie, and even what comes from McKee's been saying as well. Is that something I wonder at the end of the three in particular, and let you leave that we actually say, okay, we we'll, we'll want a little bit more work done in regards to the conclusions, what's happened since. So an update, maybe even to the next meeting, whether it's February, whether it's April, depend when, when we decide to have that. When if that would be appropriate, Jane, at that? Would that be appropriate? So, okay, because there have been a number of issues, uh, I think, uh, and points being raised, players graphed the most of them. You've caught me yourself as well, Richard, but I think as we go through, might, an update report might be appropriate, and we, at that point we could maybe have a look and say, right, okay, we agree with the conclusions now and the, and the actions that are in place or not. Richard. I may just come back to you on that particular one. If you refer to section six, I accept the committee's view that they would like to see further actions for other points than that one, but that particular paragraph is actually listed as a further action. The issue I think the committee is raising is how, would that, how do we follow up that action and report back to and whether it's been done and therefore the controls have been improved. That's exactly, how, how do we see that circle being completely finished and we see that as committee? and it's, it's been completed. Katie. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come in. Um, obviously, I'm new to this committee, so it is a, it's a new structure, and I'm still getting to grips with the, with the process on here. But I'm, my question is, and forgive me if it's not appropriate for this particular report, but we were looking at admin payroll and teachers' payroll. But you know, Jane has brought up the question, or the point there, about pay slips and timesheets. And there is mention in two point, or sorry, 4.22, manual workers do not currently have access to self-service. My point that I'm raising is I have sat in appeals and employment, and there has been issues where people have maybe had the wrong information on payslips. Is this, is this an audit looking at all of our manual time sheets? And how do we ensure that our employees, the checks or balances are in place to ensure that the hours that are claimed are actually worked? Because in some circumstances, it has been shown that those balances haven't been in place. So how do we take the information from this audit to then go through all the systems within the council? Or are we purely looking at these two specific points? As I say, apologies if, if that's not the right question at the right point. I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this, but it's, as I say, it's a, it's a concern because obviously we need to have checks and balances in place to ensure that, you know, the correct information is submitted. I would say that's been a fair question. Yeah. Richard? First of all, the pay slips simply reflect the information that's actually within the payroll system itself. The audit, and secondly, the audit sought to gain assurance on the adequacy of controls across the entire payroll system which includes the input of manual hours through whichever method, whether it was through MITS or spreadsheet input, depending if it was home carers and things. So in theory, so the audit should cover, has sought to cover that, but it does rely on the authorization control at departmental level to create a spreadsheet, which is accurately reflecting the hours that have been worked. If we're looking at home carers or manual workers. And I would imagine, Katie, and for for all the committee, that we come back to the points that have been made, okay, if we're not wholly 
satisfied because we've seen we've, we've, we've had the reassurance but actually we want to see this whole circle what's the other all the other dots joined up so we see the completion of this if we get that reported back that particular point you're bringing up on is an appropriate point I think to bring up at that point as well because hopefully we'll see that if no we can investigate or interrogate further any more questions in regards to this one we'll move on one more for Stephen, then we'll Yeah, very quick one, because obviously if we're sort of storing up these points to the very end, mm -hmm. there's a few already that I'm thinking, well, I'm going to lose track of all the ones I've stored up for this one before I get to the end. But uh, it was just, in relation to the recommendations, and I know we'll come back to how we record those actions and measure the progress against that, but um, the 413 and the section 419 and 420, I think that um, Councillor Maitland had touched on, there, there are things there where it says we must be cited on certain things or that um, uh, um, instruction to, to change something hasn't been checked for some reason and yet there's no sort of action. So I, I'm, I'm going to get to a point near the end where it's like when we use the word need or we use the word must or we use the word should, I think we need to be clear that should would reflect something where you think that's a cultural thing where you need training and good practice. Need is something where you must and are required to do something. Do you know what I mean? A need is something that is necessary. So it means how do you make something necessary happen? You require it to be to happen. So I think there's something about the language we use that should be commensurate with the measures that we would like to see put in place if we're serious about measuring progress. So if something needs to be done, it's like you can't do it unless you do that thing. If something should be done, it's like we would encourage a practice where good practice says that ought to be done. Do you know what I mean? So the, there's a difference in terms of how you could implement that, I would suggest. So I'm thinking, is that the type of thing we should be capturing so we've got the appropriate strictness of control mechanism or good practice if it's not, a, if that's where we're going to end up, you know, so it's just to feed that. No, I think that's appropriate. I, when, when I was reading through it, I thought, I think in a slightly different way, but probably the same point, I think, is, it, is this a it doesn't really matter, or is this a final written warning? How, how material, how important is it, is it actually? At what level does it lie? And it's no obvious within the report, and that's the, the kind of actions what were behind me. How actual material is this? And how important so is it? Maybe it's low level, but again, back to the leadership and the culture, right through, we need to be taking these things seriously, even if it is low level. The foundation. Stephen, then we'll move on to the next one. You know, I appreciate, appreciate the time you're giving me, Chair. Um, but the other thing is that I don't know if this reflects a... a, a something that can be trained or if there's actually weaknesses within the software system that actually says, well, actually, you could just go to the next page without having to um, tick that box. Do you know what I mean? So it could be that actually the system there doesn't allow you to have the good practice required to, prov to make the controls because there's, not, there's no um, uh, technical check or stop or prevent a, prevent a measure so human error could easily override that. So it's really just, I don't know what's a staff thing, what's a management thing, and what's an actual technical um, software thing, if you like. Um, so I'm just, so I don't know if we need to get to that level of detail. Good. And uh, what we'll find then, as we start to go through and we kind of mature it as a committee and go forward, is that if it's a particular subject matter that we're interested in, scrutiny and review, we use that as a tool. So we're looking strategically, we're taking the high level stuff, but if it gets to the point where we think, do you know what, I really need to understand what's happened operationally on the ground, a scrutiny review that allows us to do that. So we can bring it a, a particular tool we've got in the box is that, okay, we'll just use that in this particular case because we've got real concerns about it and we'll come to a conclusion at that point. So there is a, a degree of getting into a, I think for today it, it's good we're getting to this level of discussion. It's new, we're understanding, so on and so forth, but there is tools in the box as we'll start to uh, realise as we go through. So on page 33, I see it's internal audit report, the main financial systems for the pension administration. Now my points were very similar, so I'm not going to rehearse. I don't think any of the points I made earlier because they're very similar to what, uh, just the theme I picked up more than anything, so they've already been covered. Uh, apart from 4.32, <laughs> sorry, apart from 4.32, which uh, I've had reassurances out with the committee and I'll discuss, I'll, I'll relay that to you. So, but what I will say, so at 4.32, there was, there was a fire amount of money of £3 million. The council said, listen, we're £3 million short this weekend because we've got a wee cash flow crisis coming up. So we'll just, you know, there's a wee bit of extra cash sitting in the pension fund at this moment in time for particular reasons. We'll just use that and we'll get this sorted out on next Monday, Tuesday, whenever it happens. But there's no real protocols in place in which our governance structure which should we do that. So I wonder, Richard, could you maybe talk about that, if you didn't mind, just that particular thing that's happened 
and I spoke to the Section 95 officer out with, and but I'll maybe take questions. I've told them what you told me, and we might have a recommendation to go back, depending on what you're saying, uh, Richard. Thank you, Chair. This is an interesting one. In terms of, it is a technicality, in terms of the overall risk, this is a relatively, I know it's £3 million, pounds, but in terms of the council, it is a relatively small sum of money for a relatively short period. The sensitivity of this obviously goes back to those who remember a certain Robert Maxwell, um, where companies were, pension funds were robbed blind, and therefore there's a standing principle that an organisation should not borrow from its pension funds. Um, and therefore it is not a good practice for it, the council to do. And therefore for us it is about regularising in what circumstances it is possible for us to borrow from our pension fund and whether it is acceptable. The event has happened. It is fairly low risk and that's why we brought it attention to members. And I think you're quite right to speak to the Section 95 officer to consider how this could be addressed in future. If indeed you wish to allow it to happen in future. That last point is a very, very good point. So I've not got any hands up at this moment in time, so I'll, Stephen, then John. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, interestingly, we've got um, a pension subcommittee coming up later this week, and um, uh, members on that committee will probably be aware that, you know, you, if you're on the pension committee, you certainly can't sort of play fast and loose. Um, with pension money because of strict regulations governing how you administer the scheme. So uh, often we'll get told on that committee, so it's maybe seeing this from another side, that maybe there'll be times when you need liquidity in the fund because there's opportunities to invest in something and blah, 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 blah. So I don't know. And I, I, I would, well, I can't assume anything is what this paper tells me. Um, I would not know because it doesn't say or demonstrate any, any evidence to suggest that yeah, there was a check done that there was no outstanding transaction awaiting the pension fund to invest in something or that that money wasn't meant to be paid out to members or nothing, no information, just that, yeah, we needed the money the weekend to pay you back when I get my gyro or whatever, you know, so I, 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 I you know, from, from the pension fund sort of thing, we, we wouldn't, there's a kind of, a, a, as good a wall as there should be between the finances of this, the pension fund and the council budget, and I think there's, um, uh, there's certainly something there which I think doesn't, it doesn't feel right and it doesn't look right and, uh, and there's a lot of money as well so the perception alone is enough to suggest that it shouldn't really happen unless there's clear um, um, rationale behind it and a sort of justification that members can have sight of would be my initial input. Thank you, Chair. That was certainly my gut feeling. But so I'll really, once everybody says, spoken, I'll really what the Section 85 officer advice he gave me uh, so, John, you're next then, Malcolm. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, much on the same point uh, as what uh, Stephen was saying there. I mean, I looked at the the last sentence uh, on page 38 of uh, 4.32. The governance rules for such transactions should therefore be reviewed and clarified. Now, if that's a statement to say that uh, we should consider the, the council to be an investment body to, to pull three million pounds into. Uh, I, I would uh, uh, like to consider that we don't go down that road uh, for reasons which were highlighted by yourself and also by by Stephen. Uh, the the yeah. It, it was mainly on that point that uh, you, it should never have happened. You know, regardless how short the council finds themselves in, in funds, that money should never have been transferred over. That's just basically the point. But I think we're all kind of come to the same conclusion. But I would certainly not like to go down and review this to say that we can uh, invest or use the council as an authorised investment body. If that was the case, I mean... Uh, we gave, we gave the council three million pounds over three three days weekend or whatever it was. We should have had at least interest on that. I don't know if that's been transpired. If if it was a genuine investment body, uh, that would have happened. Uh, so obviously the three million's been shifted into one pot and paid back. But we've still got three million. But maybe should have had a wee bit extra uh, for sorting out the council's problems, to say the least. I agree with I agree with those comments entirely. 
Right, so are you... Okay, I'll let, let Richard come in and then you, Malcolm. I'm not sure it makes a huge difference to the transaction, but just for the record, yes, there was an interest calculated over that pe short period. Pension Fund Committee members would probably want to see it think at least somewhere between 5 and 7 percent. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm. Yeah, I was just going to make that point exactly about the level of interest that uh, June would appear to have been quite a month for the council with treasury management, if people were on the committee yesterday, would point out there was one instance where we had too much money, so we had to make a transfer. Then we got caught short and had to get a payday loan from the pension fund. And uh, again, as someone that sits on the pension fund, I'm pension uh, committee, I'd be very much against the council using that for, as part of its finance. And we, we got a, quite a eloquent statement on that from uh, from Paul Garrett the other day about why we shouldn't do it as well from a simple point of view of the fact that the council can borrow money at quite low rates and the pension fund looks for a much bigger rate of return so it'll be interesting to see how much interest they did actually pay but you can't get away from the fact that someone here has transferred money without the correct governance and authorisation in place and that is quite a breach. Okay, no, thank you for that. No other hands uh, coming up. So what, John? Yep. Sorry, Chair, can we talk about other things is in the pensions is, uh, to get away from yeah, the obvious can. one? What I'll just cover first then is the advice that Paul gave to me, and if we feel it appropriate, we'll ask him to come do and give it, you get right for the horse's mouth rather than from me. Yeah. So you're getting a second hand from me at this moment in time. So Paul I've just got a, few, uh, a couple of questions on the rest of the, the pension part. Do, of the do you mind if we just cover this wee bit? Then yes, we'll, then that way, if we, cause we may want him down here to hear it for us. If we do, then we can get into another business and he can come down at his, his leisure, so to speak. So he said it was appropriate what happened, in his view. Absolutely. Uh, he said it was only, only over a weekend, related to saying it was low risk. And absolutely, he would promote that we actually change our funding strategy to make, come back to your point, John, that actually the council would be one of those organisations that we could invest uh, invest in so to speak so it's now if that was the case then it would be for the, the pension committee to actually consider that would be up to them to do that so it's whether I think that's the advice we got actually it was so that gave me reassurances well it gives the assurance that okay it was was a low level and actually Paul's actually promoting that it, sh it should be the case do we think we need to hear from Paul himself or do we we'll make a request for him to come down and whenever he comes in we'll come back to that point or he's satisfied with that second hand related uh, conversation from me, Jane. Right. I, I think I think um, you can cover that in the recommendation. Okay. I think well, I think we, uh, I think there's absolutely no question about it that we do need to get a full explanation. Um, but I think it can be covered when we deal with the right exactly updated. Okay. Excellent, Stephen. Are you content with that? Uh, the pension fund and the council effectively are, might as well be two separate things. If the pension fund is going to decide that it sees the council as an opportunity for investment short-term loan, that's up to the pension fund. I think what this presents is the council saw fit to draw from the pension fund. That's not an investment opportunity. That, you know, so depending on what way around you do it, one's taking money from the other. That's not the pension fund choosing to do something. That's something getting taken from it. Now, however that may, it may, it may, it may pay per exercise, you know, in terms of accounting or whatever, but the you know that that's what it's not the pension fund determining that that's the council taken from the pension. What I'll fund. do is I'll ask Richard to make comment in regards to the comments that I've just made with advice uh, from uh, a section eighty five officer. So Richard, in your view, as the chief internal uh, representing the chief internal auditor of the council, do you think that advice was appropriate advice? But we will pick up on it later on in, in regards to particular actions we may or may not want to take or recommend. So. You've picked it up as a low risk, you've identified it, you're telling us about it, but what Stephen and, and others are saying, listen, it's not appropriate that the, the council should be able to access money. So just before I bring in Jock, I'll just ask Richard to respond on that. Is there a conflict between the, the two pieces, the internal audit review and the, and the advice that we've been given indirectly through myself? This is, it was obviously of sufficient concern to myself to bring it to the committee's attention which have done so in this particular report. I'm conscious of the gentleman sitting behind me. I promise I wouldn't bring him up front, but on this particular one, given the, the difficult issues involved, I think the Chief Internal Auditor should speak for himself on that particular question. 
Um, absolutely fine. Apologies. Right? Exactly. Inappropriate. No, absolutely fine, Richard. Thank you for that. So, thank you. So, we have got our backup here. Appropriate, I think, Kevin, in regards to that. So, I mean, it is a, it's, it's a low level question in real terms. We're not looking to come in and criticise you about anything like that, but we want an open and honest view from yourself because I've, I've spoke to Section 95 officer. He's relayed what he thinks is, is, is appropriate, but the, the committee obviously has a different view in regards to that. It's been picked up by yourselves in particular. What do you think? Thank you, Chair. I think, um, really referring to Councillor Wilson's comment that he made, it is a matter for the Pension Fund Committee members to make a decision about whether or not they wish to see this in the future. So the question about whether it should or shouldn't happen in the future sits with the committee, with, with another committee. For this committee, our concern that we're expressing to you is very much that, as Councillor Wilson said, there wasn't a governance arrangement in place. Sorry, governing uh, 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 Councillor Thompson. Is. So, sorry, Councillor Thompson. Sorry. Th John. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Governor. Where I got that from? <laughs> I apologise. Uh, so um, yes, when we saw the transaction, we were a bit sort of hmm, not sure. We we do not have a definitive position. You know, we haven't mentioned the word legal deliberately because we do not have a definitive position on whether this is legal or not. Should we say? So we discussed it with the Section 95 officer who was concerned about it, but on a pragmatical, practical position, what he's saying is, well, I don't see why it shouldn't be possible to do that. He acknowledged that the governance arrangements were not in place to allow it to take place, but his position is perhaps they should be. So that's, I think, the advice he's giving you is that perhaps they should be. Um, the discussion we had with him was very much along the lines of, we are leaving it for you to resolve this matter and to come back. And that's the position, effectively, we've got in the report, which is to say we've raised it as a concern. The Section 95 or so, who is totally trustworthy and reliable and professional, should be looking at this in the round, not just from the practical point of view. In other words, it would be handy to have this facility. It has to be that governance arrangement has to be acceptable. So th that has yet to be determined. I would imagine he would have to consult SIPFA and other organizations about this. And ultimately, even if he comes back with a recommendation that says, yes, we can do it, it will be for the Pensions Fund Committee to decide whether they accept that proposal or not. So we're uncomfortable with this, but no, not so uncomfortable that we have to sort of start muttering about the legality or these sorts of things. Thanks so much, Kevin, and that's quite clear. Jock, do you still want to come in? Oh, it's just, just a quickie. I think uh, pension funds are separate for the Council, but I think a long time ago, Part of the funding for the ice bowl was paid for by the pension fund. But I think since then, pension fund can't kind of loan to itself, sort of thing, or to its own council. It could it could loan to, to an outreach. I think I've seen somewhere where we've borrowed from another pension fund, totally different to our own. And I think that's the way it operates. We can't kind of borrow to your own. But I think it's something that should be investigated, no doubt about it. So I would imagine that will get caught up with this. If when we consider the how we get these actions back, and we we'll consider my future report, we'll capture that as well at the same time. But I think that's good advice we've had for Kevin uh, in regards to that. John, your next, because your other points away from this, your two other points, I think, away from pension. Oh, <laughs> right. uh, page page thirty-five. Uh, uh, it was the uh, four point uh, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Uh, that, it was the case of uh, uh, members can change from a de defined benefit scheme to a defined contribution scheme, but it was the statement that if they go down that road so they can access the whole pot, for instance, uh, that uh, the, the flexible benefits must provide evidence of receiving independent financial advice, uh, you, you know, before the, the pension fund would consider that sort of action. Uh, on 14, they, te they tested 10 transfers to to the scheme, or th these are new people coming into the scheme, and then 4.15 4 was they tested 10 transfers out of the scheme, uh, which some of them uh, 
we're going into these uh, flexible benefit schemes, which uh, uh, they also evidence the independent financial advice received. Now, I suppose the question I want to ask is, uh, if, if somebody's coming into the scheme, and, uh, you know, do we ask that they must have financial, sound financial or evidence of financial advice to, to bring their money into our pension fund, uh, as opposed to the 10 that was leaving the fund? You, you know, we're, we're insisting that they must provide evidence before, you know, we, we, we consider them transferring their pension from a benefit scheme to a, a, a contribution scheme. I hope that makes sense. It's quite complicated. There are two different sort of schemes at the moment. Uh, one, you can actually, actually access the whole pot if you really want to. The other one, which is the one that uh, we run for, for members, you cannot unless you change it from one scheme to the other, and then you can access the whole pot. And you, you can under, I can understand why you must uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, independent financial advice because of, if somebody thinks, that, oh, I've got £500,000 sitting in a pot there, I'll just take the whole lot out and just spend, blow it on a whatever. And, and you can clearly see that we're, we're insisting that uh, they must have that financial advice. But I'm just wondering if it swings both ways, you know, it, as well as members coming into the scheme as opposed to members going out. In terms of the require, requirements for independent financial advice, um, this is based on regulations and it specifically relates to the transfer to private schemes. It would, of course, be for, and if someone's holding a pension with a different provider, it would, of course, be up to that provider to suggest that before the money is transferred from themselves, that they seek advice. They require advice before they would allow the money to be paid to the council. So it is the other, it is the onus on the other provider rather than ourselves when we receive money into the scheme. In terms of, it does specifically relate to private providers on the basis that the, in the case of public sector pension schemes, the schemes are offering the same benefits that we are offering from our pension scheme. So the risk to the pensioner is therefore much lower in, t in terms of a transfer. So they're not effectively making such a big decision if you transfer to another local government scheme or indeed to the SPPA, because you'll have the same level of pension benefits that you would have done within the council. So those measures in place in particular to protect the person themselves, yeah. John? Yeah, so in other words, if I decide to transfer my pension into a private provider, then you would ask me for, have I got the, the sound financial advice to do so? Yeah. Thank you. Stephen? Thanks again, Chair. Um, so, uh, a couple of things. One was on, um, well, you've got, you've got the accuracy at 4.20 of uh, the system being called into question, um, so, which is sort of out with uh, user error, if you like. Um, or it raises a question as to, is there something there that needs to be checked, or is there something in the system that needs to be sort of raised? I, although that's a uh, uh, mentioned, there's no, it's not clear what the sort of action resulting from that might be, um, if indeed there requires to be one, or again, it could be a scale or, or a level of risks at issue, I'm not sure. So I, I was just really to sort of get the detail on that. There's also an interesting thing on 4.24, um, where it talks about uh, the a number of cases which happen to end up getting re resolved um, to do with care home places, but then there was a little section about just a note, and I thought, oh, is that? I didn't know if that was a veiled sort of, I didn't know how to read it. Uh, we know there was a further 300 employment um, matches which have yet to be investigated. Now, I don't know if that's a week and a, you better get on with those, or if it was like, oh, we're just noting that there's 300. I didn't know really how to um, ap apprehend that really, I suppose, properly. And then just on another uh, thing on 4.26, which does sort of come to in the conclusions at the end, and I wasn't sure if this is some kind of extortion racket gone wrong, but there seemed to have been a punching error, uh, which resulted in an overpayment of £500. So I was just sort of wondering, is that just a kind of archaic, uh, the, the language of the trade, so a punching error, just struck me as quite amusing for some reason, probably inappropriately. But um, yeah, so it was just those, those points really, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. If I could deal with them in order that you've raised them, to start with, 
the pension system we use is a national system and occasionally in complex cases I believe there can be mis incorrect calculations by the system which is why we have a system amongst staff for the calculations that come out of Altair to be checked by one member of staff and then verified by another one. Now in this particular case, unfortunately it happened that both neither member of staff managed to pick up the error within the pension being calculated. Um, and that is a weakness of the authorization control. I don't, the control exists. I'm not sure what further control we could add in that particular case apart from it is human error when we've already got an authorization for it. Um, that's okay for that one. For 424, this is down to the time of the audit and when the data was provided from the National Fraud Initiative. Um, the higher risk cases are those pensioners where unfortunately we continue to pay a pension after they've passed away. The other ones are where people in employment who are receiving a pension now re-enter employment and need to have their pension abated. I spoke to the pension section yesterday and that work has now been completed. In terms of 426, it probably was an unfortunate turn of phrase. What I meant was an input error. So the actual input document stated the correct pensioner number. But unfortunately, when it was entered into the payroll system, it was actually the, the wrong pension was updated. And that resulted in an increase to someone's pension of 500 leading to an overpayment of £500 before it was corrected back to the correct pensioner. Thank you. Thanks very much. On page 39, the Internal Audit Review, use of purchase cards within schools. I notice. And we'll come back to the further reports, reassurances after this one. You know, like join, go out for the last one. So, up to members again. Comes from a key, Jock. I'm sorry, but to me, this makes horrendous reading. Have we trained the people that are using these cards? That, to me, that, that's what it seems to boil down to. People are using them, just seem to be using them hard lib. And whether it's onto their own account or other people's accounts or the, the correct account, I don't know. But it would appear that staff in the schools all need training. And that I would urge that that's, that's done as quickly as possible. There's no good uh, sending out paper blaming folk for doing this, that, and the next thing. If they hadn't had advice on how these cards should be used, then it's us to blame, not them. Well, that's, that's my view anyway, Chair. I think that's a, certainly a view. Don't you have any comments in regards to that, Richard, or not? Thank you, Chair. I think that is actually more or less the conclusion of the report. I would, however, note a development since then that we are now the council is looking at a new system of purchase cards um, with a different provider and therefore the system will be looked at in terms of the controls in place. I was at a meeting yesterday and certainly I would wish to be involved in the setup of the system to ensure there's appropriate controls in place. Thank you. And again, we'll come back to that particular point, Jock, when we sum it, the whole thing up at the end of this one and make sure we get the reassurance to report back on, on these outcomes. John, you're next. Dr Campbell. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Just on the same thing as Councillor McKee here. Uh, you know, the, the simplicity of keeping invoices and stuff like that, you know, so that you've got a paper trail, you can prove what you paid it for. I'm not saying there's any impropriety, uh, but, I mean, silly things like uh, invoices and stuff like that, uh, on the, I, I would agree with the training side of it because I mean if you if you've got a card holder that's going out and spending uh, several thousand pounds a year, I mean for example the total spend was uh, near nigh on 421k for for the the year of 2018, and uh, you know to some of them saying that they didn't realise that they could claim the VAT back, you know, at 20% of that. That's 84,000 pounds on that sort of figure, but I would imagine that that figure, uh, some of the VAT has already been claimed back, so the, 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 the actual figure of purchases might be over half a million, which again, you know, you're talking about 100,000 pounds of VAT that could have been spent elsewhere if they had just claimed it. I, I know there's, uh, there's bits in the paper that says, you know, that, that there was purchases of less than £50, but even so, I mean, 20%, that's that's £1 in every five that you could be getting back on, whether it's a pencil case or whatever it is that you need for the school. 
It's, uh, but definitely training. Uh, if, if you're going to have a designated car, card holder, and then I would suggest that they know that they can claim the bar back, they can, they must spend it on, uh, you know, on the, the, the school's Amazon account, if, if they have such one, or a guest Amazon account, uh, and not use their own Amazon account. Same with their Tesco cards, if you, if you got your key fob and you zap it and you get the points and all that, make sure it's a, it's a school key fob that you're using and not your own one. Things like that. It's silly little things, but it all adds up and, you know, the, the, there's huge money there that could be spent on other things, you know, if people just use them properly. But again, I, that probably boils down to training. There's a lot of points made there, Richard. I don't know if you want to respond to that at all. I mean, it, in fact, I think the statement I made earlier was, doesn't really matter, or does it? And it's that, that's where I kind of captured it myself. It's set on a low level, but if there's any comments. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I can only really refer you to section 6.2, which in a different form of words actually more or less says the same thing, that administrators should be re reminded of the requirement. I would agree with that entirely. Councillor Bell, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Just on the purchase cars, also there's fuel cars as well, and I obviously, Richard, obviously the, 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 uh, members have flagged up a lot of highlights here today regarding the, the, the purchase cars and various issues here. Have you ever contacted anyone from the private sector to see how they're doing it on uh, individual farms to see what their fuel cars, uh, if they're going, in, going into Tesco, if they're going buying individual items on purchase cars? I think members should know as well. Remember the, the head teacher the, the other day at Carlisle, £188,000 embezzled and uh, sentenced for just under three years. And she was embezzling money for a period of seven years. And it took, uh, once she left the school, uh, a year later found out. So I think you'll probably read that, read that in the paper. And it was purchased cars as well. I hope that doesn't happen here. OK, I don't know if you want to respond to that or not, Richard. I'll leave it to you. Something about the private sector, I think, in particular, maybe. I think it was slightly further south. I think it was actually Keswick. But you're right, I did read the... We're in Cumbria. <laughs> I did read the news story, you're quite right. Um, and I personally haven't looked at the private sector, but as I said earlier, I do recognise fully that, that there needs to be robust control over the use of purchase cards, both in terms of when the original transaction is processed, but also in terms of the facilities for purchase cards allow management to review in real time transactions as they're taking place and to also limit the types of transactions to certain merchant categories. Now these controls, the technology being rolled out by the banks is, it's as robust as it can be because it's designed for everybody, both the private sector and the public sector. The real issue for me is how effectively do we use the facilities available to us when we take on a system to ensure that we are getting the best that we can out of these systems to ensure the best control we can achieve. Thank you. John? Yeah, thanks for letting me come back in. Just to touch on what Richard was saying about 6.2 and page 46. I mean, the statement just says it should be reminded. I mean, if that's in the form of an email, I don't think that's sufficient enough. I, I, I would like to see, you know, that those cardholders uh, have a, even a training session or something like that, but somebody has to sit them down and say, invoices, PAT, whatever it is that we need to do, and that's the way we're going to do it from now on. And I think we'll come back to, and we'll just cover it now before we let Jane go, but we'll come back to that point. What do we expect to see come back? And in particular, I'll probably all four reports, but these three in particular, I think, we need to see coming back. The comments have been made that are picked up. Previous practice, in regards to the people at Equity Fund, the PEF funding, so we did a scrutiny review. It was an internal audit review of that, I think. It was an internal audit review. And the fact that, I so it was performing very low level, and the fact that, okay, it was made aware to the to the Education Department that, okay, we'd have watched for eye over that, body, but it, the performance went like that. And I think similar will happen to this. If we, if, we, if we can capture this in the right format, bring it back so we okay, You've come to a conclusion here, but the committee thinks we need to be stronger. We'll see that in a, in a future report. This is what we expect from that, because we've only got the stuff in front of today. We'll have a chance to consider that through a, a proper report. And at that point, I think we'll start to see real results. So the likes of this, these behaviours are unacceptable. If it's coming from the committee of the council, that means the council saying that's unacceptable. We have to get a house in order. So whether it's training, whether it's uh, educating to the right level, or whether it's actually disciplinary, one extreme to the other. But there's a whole load of measures that, that we can take to bring this into order.
Going back to getting the foundations right. Jane, and then we'll, we'll move on if that's okay. All right. I suppose uh, each of these has had sort of one, one issue that really appears to be outstanding. And of course, we can't look at everything just on the basis of one outstanding issue. But um, 440, the largest single purchase for an OBO at £7,800. Yeah. Um, I thought that was an astonishing price for an OBO. And I mean, later on in the, um, in the report, it talks about um, people maybe purchasing out with the council's contract arrangements um, for personal preference um, and maybe um, an over-specification. Um, have we got anything? I mean, I see, that, I see that procurement team was consulted, but I'm nevertheless still astonished at that level of... Because I, I know that it's perfectly possible to get um, a, a, um, uh, an instrument um, of the the level that is required um, for about half that, perfectly possible. Um, anyway, so um, I, I, I put that in there because it, it does seem to me odd, um, and I'm, I, I understand that it's been through the procurement team, but nevertheless it does strike. If it was a, a member of the public, they would think that was strange if they, if they simply were presented with that information there. Um, the, the other thing here um, in 442, can we possibly please, in um, the section 6, it doesn't really take up the issue of the purchase cards being used to avoid using contracted suppliers. And that's something that we have really tried hard to, to reinforce because of the extra hidden cost, as so correctly said, with respect to admin. And I think that should be... Um, something which we also capture in the recommendations later. So I suppose we'll all come back to that. So Richard, two points here, but we'll come, certainly come back to these as well. Then I'll probably bring Kate in because it's probably the same point, but then I'll let, I'll let it then Stephen after that. Richard. In terms of the OBO, I'm afraid Jane has the advantage of me. But I'm not an expert on the cost of musical instruments and it did seem high to myself. In terms of the controls in place, we rely on the fact that the method of payment was the purchase card, but in this particular case, the procurement did actually follow another route, which was to get the appro what officers considered to be the appropriate advice as to value for money and tendering and things. So that's outside the scope of what this particular one is. The separate issue which Jane raised in terms of following established contracts, I understand a lot of the expenditure within schools is not is actually relating to home economics lessons, which doesn't fit so quite so easily with an established contract for food purchases. It's to do with the home economics teacher requiring deciding what they're going to cook on a particular day and needing to make a purchase for that. I'm not sure how that fits within the council contracts for food. But there's a valid point there to say that certainly purchase cards shouldn't be a way of bypassing existing procurement procedures. That's a fair comment. Katie, was it on the same musical instrument point? It, it, it was, um, Chair, and while I don't believe I've got any conflicts of interest, I am aware of one noble player within the region who is advanced to grade 8, attends the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, and I would say that that's actually a reasonable price for a noble. So just, I would say that, what I would say is, the next instrument I'm planning on buying for my child, which is at similar level, will probably be in excess of £10,000 for a violin. So that is the cost of these things. What I would say is there has been encouragement for parents to purchase instruments through the school system to save the 20% VAT. So while I don't know the, the individual details of this, I would just sort of add my personal knowledge that that's actually not actually that expensive, believe it or not, because that is just simply the cost of these things. And if we're allowing our young people to purchase instruments that cost that, but can save the 20% VAT, and there's a system, and it, it clearly states that it was you know, authorised within the system, I think that's just an acceptance of that, the, the facts of, these, of the matter. Thanks for that uh, advice. Clarification, I guess, that it adds uh, weight to it. So we have got... We have got Councillor Thompson and then Jock, we'll, we'll give you the last word in regards to this. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the same point, but we we did undertake a procurement uh, scrutiny review, growing, growing the local economy through the procurement process. 
and that's one of the things we are actually exhausted with. How, but we did, we were clear about actually allowing the degree of flexibility, whether it's the school purchasing or small businesses, but try and keep things as local as we can. So I, we have to have flexibility built in there as well, so that we, uh, we there's framework, there, there may well be frameworks so okay, we, we stick to an absolute protocol, but we're buying from China, from America, from everywhere else apart from our local homegrown stuff. So there's something that would be considered, but obviously we'll come back to that at some point in the future because Jean's picked it up. Stephen, then Jock, give you the last word and then we'll hit the evacuation button for Jean. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and yes, totally agree with Councillor Maitland. That, um, it does actually mention it just in terms of non-compliant spend. So there will be a sense of a way that we can include that to allow the you know the short-term kind of flexibility that schools need, but having regard for where that where it's appropriate, uh, where there's an existing contract or whatever that we can avail ourselves of that. I think I think just taking that in context of the there's six there's names at the start. There's like well, it doesn't name, but it outlines at the start. There's sixty. Um, approved card holders and seven in an application list and it's finance and procurement um, service that actually approve people I think to be named card holders it seems to be what it's saying so it, it does I think my concern is like I suppose uh, I, I might have to abandon my own what I would expect if somebody's going to be the card holder for a secondary school I would almost have assumed that they would have a sort of you know, a basic level of kind of, oh yeah, when you buy something, you get a receipt. Do you know what I mean? That kind of, you know, it, it doesn't seem unreasonable, but then it could, it maybe you, you do need systems in place that do all that for you nowadays because people have different ways of working. But, um, and, and the fact that, as, as it was touched on, um, there are systems that might record how we spend money better if only we use the system to its full. Um, and I, I gather that's part of a rollout. But again, that seems to be a training and or response even just a respect for the role of cardholder. <laughs> you know, it's like, if you do that, put it, put the entry in the right place. So I don't know if, if finance procurement, when they're approving applications to be cardholders, could maybe suggest that, listen, you're going to be the person who holds the card, do it properly, and here's the training on how to do that. But, um, because I, I do worry that, are we getting the right person to be the cardholder if this is the level of standard we have found to be... <laughs> in existence so it's maybe you know but anyway it's just those points really chair thank you no no i think it's appropriate but i mean there should be a minimum skill set in regards to it or the other you should not be the card holder and if you've got to get your training first fair enough certain licensing boards you've got to go through a level of training before you can set on them for members and so on and so forth jock then we'll move on to item yeah but i think uh, to a certain extent i can agree with councillor thompson but i think maybe a level that they are allowed to buy to should be introduced maybe a couple of thousand pound maximum Anything over that should come into the centre and they would do the, the uh, uh, purchasing from the appropriate people. So I think it, there is maximum there. There's a threshold, but it's to what limit, I suppose, is a, a negotiation over that, Jock. You may be right. Right. We'll see you, Jane. That's OK. Thank you. Right. So item number four, just give Jane a wee chance to move on. I'll just make some very light comments in regards to this. I thought it was a good report. I actually enjoyed all these reports. Come back to my initial comments. I really did, Richard, believe it or not. Uh, and the only thing I would say to this, coming when it came to the conclusions, were much, much stronger. And I'll leave it there and let's see what everybody else says first. But when it came to this programme, we got, and I've actually got clear conclusions. Actually, you spoke okay. to Scottish Government, it's come back, and the uh, leaders saw they've come out and said that these type of things have been approved in the past, they've accepted, and blah, blah, blah. I just felt this was a, a more informed report to the three beforehand. And it felt almost like an in house, out house kind of approach. That's maybe another case. So we'll open up to members first. Uh, leader, not being out of house, but almost, kind of, to almost sit to the side. But no hands whatsoever. Stephen. So um, I, I was quite interested in this one, if only, I mean, what, what kind of made me read it again was um, that uh, the management had a more robust response, if you like, uh, to the recommendations um, in that they kind of said, uh, well, well, they give a response. Um, say no, no, we did everything right. It's somebody else's fault, you know, what kind of thing. So, um, uh, but however, in, in sort of reading back through it, I mean, it, it did seem to be a wee bit of a concern about the change in nature of of the application. In one case, where it materially changed, sort of after they'd assessed the original application, and then there was issue about whether or not it was appropriate to use the money to get a still um, from for the one that was producing alcohol. But they've kind of sort of said no no that's somebody else's there's a precedent for that it just wasn't clear that 
that seemed to be like uh, saying, well, somebody else has done it, therefore it's okay, rather than there was no evidence to say that they'd actually consulted with and checked with somebody who had the appropriate authority to say, yeah, that's fine. So, so it didn't, it wasn't evident in the report. So it was kind of maybe, I wasn't clear if the appropriate advice had been sought or they just looked over the fence and seen that somebody else had done it and said, yeah, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? So it didn't come out in the report for that. Um, but beyond that, I mean, just low level comments that I'll, I'll defer to yourself, Chair, on that one. So I suppose a question I would, I would come through, what Stephen said there, did you get the reassurances in regards to the comment, the conclusion, or the, the, the management's response? Would you reassure that actually what they were saying was, was factually correct and appropriate? I think, would that be a fair, fair way of summarising? You look for the reassurance that actually it's not, it wasn't just a look over a, okay, we'll take it as they've, or, or the, manage, the managers involved or the department involved have looked and said, okay, we can refer to this, this and that, but did we get the reassurances? Did our internal auditors get the reassurances this was factual and correct? That's what I'm picking up for what you're saying, Stephen. Maybe wrong. So specifically, the second bullet point on, the, on page 50 at the bottom, the Scottish Government had previously accepted projects involved in the production of alcohol. Seemed to be, that is why we've allowed this, not because we've asked them and they've said it's okay. Or we've, we've not double-checked. It didn't, didn't, didn't seem to double-check. They just said, yeah, they've done that before with somebody else, so it's fine. Which to me wasn't really a control as such. That's like... Well, I, 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 I will ask a broad question to start off. And, okay, because you're quite strong with this one, Richard. I think you're quite clear and it was quite firm. I thought, oh, that's quite good. It's showing clear leadership in regards to your position, your approach that they've taken. So were you satisfied with the response that you had and did you do any due diligence in regards to checks and balances that what they were saying was, was uh, appropriate? I'll leave it at that low-level language. Thank you, Chair. I'm afraid I haven't gone back to the Scottish Government myself to confirm the accuracy of that. The leader programme itself is very heavily audited. And there is actually another audience for this report above ourselves, and that is these audits are done once a year as part of the grant requirements and are actually submitted to the Scottish Government for review. So there is another message, if there were, to say that we have looked at these, report, these projects and queried these particular ones, which will then go to the Scottish Government audits to be considered as well. But no, you're right, I have not actually confirmed directly. I, mean, I think that's personally okay, but because I mean, the people I've spoken to in the past, business people and such like, have, have engaged with leader, feel as if by the end of it they've been pulled through a hedge backwards <laughs> in regards to the checks, balances, due diligence, so on and so forth, and say they'll never ever apply again. Uh, so, I mean, that's certainly what, what that's the responses that I've been getting for the organisation. It's so difficult to access money from the, the, this particular funding stream, and it seems to be the case. But it comes from a key then. Oh, well, same point then, then yourself, Joe. One second, Stephen. Yeah, so while I appreciate that the applicants might have, have, you know, their hurdles when they're going through the leader process, this is more about how leader, uh, I suppose, do their decisions and as to why. So it was more because they don't, I'm sure some people might look at the thing and think, oh, well, actually they go through a lot less scrutiny than what we do whenever we're actually applying for the thing. Um, so it just seemed to be a bit, not cavalier is not the right word, but it, it just seemed to be... Um, uh, they weren't under the same scrutiny, so that whenever they were taking a decision about funding, it was like, well, yeah, that's happened before, that's fine. So, and I don't, I think the applicants to the fund might have had a much tougher time in terms of justifying why they'd done some and then what, what leader appeared to have offered in terms of as to why they've made a certain decision. So that was all it was. We'll pick that point up then, and as we go forward at the end of this, we'll get Jane back in and we'll. Jock? Hi, thanks, Chair. Talking about funding, if you look at 417. We note that some transactions entered into LARCs over a year ago are awaiting payment and we have been advised this is due to staffing difficulties in the Scottish Government. So how are these people supposed to cope with all this? There's people waiting on that money and probably that's part of their livelihood. So it's ridiculous. That it's over, over a year that we're, we've been waiting on a, a payment. Are, are we contacting the Scottish Government kind of regularly to give them a stir up? I'm not sure this is going to reassure the committee or not, but actually the projects themselves are not awaiting payment. It's just ourselves that are awaiting reimbursement from the Scottish Government. <laughs> that's, that's a reassurance that we are carrying the current for such a time. They allow these projects to go forward, the local economy to grow further. No further questions. Jane, if you could hear this, come back in, please, so we can discuss. 
In fact, so it will give you a minute. Normally I get told in the group room what time we're finishing at four o'clock. out. So, <laughs> didn't it this morning, luckily enough. But we, I mean, we, we can speed things up if, if, I mean, I've never, it's the first meeting I've been to where Council Scobie hasn't he? Spoken at, to, to this level. I know he will. I know he's got, he's got he comes scrutiny views about he's there, he's poised. Look, he, he's, he, he's like a tiger ready to attack. Man. He's prey, so he is. But, uh, thanks, Jane, for coming back in. So, when it comes to capturing, I think, I don't know if it's yourself that really wants to capture it or, or do, you want, do we want to run through every single item? I mean, we've got a long, long list, or do we want to? Look at that in the future. I mean, it is a big list of stuff. Or do we want to capture it in general terms to say, okay, in regards to, but leave us to list maybe yeah, to yeah. what? There were certainly a couple of themes that, you, that you've that you identified. Um, in terms of future um, internal audit reports, and I know that um, Kevin is already looking at the format of reports, but you have expressed a desire that the, the recommendations are more explicit. And in particular, the sort of definition about a service should do something or it must do something in terms of compliance is something that we can um, look at in terms of the format. For the update reports on these individual um, internal audits, I don't propose to run through all the, the detailed issues. We've, we've certainly captured them between us. Um, and your update report will include certain issues like, you know, perhaps the dates and the response from uh, the services about them. Two general themes have come through. One was about compliance, basic compliance with existing um, council controls and protocols. And perhaps the other issue you'd be interested in is training, because that seems to have come up in the, in the three um, audits in the first three. I, I was just wondering in general terms, so rather than getting the themes at this moment, do we get a report back discussing this whole subject matter? And I have got a view in regards to the internal, the, lay, the, the layout, how we progress, the, how we, the, any future internal audit reports. Mm -hmm. But it's something I'll just put to committee. We haven't discussed it at any great level. Just we put that to wait and see what you think. I've got a view in regards to that. But I just think, how can we actually capture it in the form of a report that will get reported back to us, what's been said today, and then we can reconsider that and, and obviously as part of that report, it'll be an update. These, these points were brought up. And this is actually the outcomes to that. Mm -hmm. We could have had a simple report like that, whether it's to the next or in April. I mean, I've been back to any other business. Hopefully, we'll have a meeting in April, is what I'm going to, certainly, uh, February, sorry, I'm going to propose, because the next meeting isn't scheduled till April with the volume of the, the work that we've got. Mm -hmm. So, my own proposal in regards to just to put it out to the committee, when it comes to, and I've already run this past uh, Kevin, which I normally would, then I, I think each individual internal report uh, review merits its own report. Personally, so we'd had another. We had four individual items, and as part of that report, it would be a basic report. We'd look through it, but then we'd be able to, as part of the recommendation paragraph two, we could then refer back. So today, we would have captured each individual report. We would have captured the themes of the particular action we wanted done. So it would either come back and form a formal report, or we say we're satisfied with the conclusion that's come. That's just so that's something we can either. That's just for consideration. Very much off the cuff, but I did think so when it comes to taking our internal reports. See the audits report serious and be able to clearly identify. And these are fairly low level, I would say, important but low level internal audit reviews, but a part of our basic meeting gravy. So it's, it's something that we do do uh, every can when every year we look at this this type of uh, function, this type of audit. So I don't know. I mean, that's the two. Do, can, can we can yeah. we bring that back in, in the form of the, the discussion of the meeting today and the, the outcomes that we want for the conclusions in regards to the the the, the four reviews? And uh, can we actually have a, a in, in future report? And do we, do we take each internal audit review as a as an individual report rather than four appendixes to a to a report? That's the two points. I'll throw that out there for consideration. And Liz, have you got any comments? Certainly, your um, remit provides for you to get a progress report, and as I understand it, that already happens. That you do get an update report on the implementation of recommendations. So. That's already built into your programme for next year. And I think your comments about the format, as I say, that perhaps is something that we'll look at. Um, maybe discuss that at workshop with you. And then the, the next set of internal audit reports could be in a slightly different format, if that's something that, that you agree between you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, absolutely. I think for, for clarity, having separate reports on each, I think is 
really sensible way forward. Um, one of the points I was wondering is, do we have a, a forward plan for this so we know what audit reports are coming, when they're due, you know, just a timeline so that we know and we can say, well, we were due back a report on that date. Have we had it? If we've not, there may be reasons for that. And will it come, you know, just so we can keep an eye on, our eye on the, all the different reports, because, you know, members are exceedingly busy. We've, we're sitting in many committees and actually just having a clear forward plan. We have it for area committee, we have it for council. Can we have it potentially if other members would like for this as well? Absolutely, and we, and, and we do, and I think it's something we've been laxed on to a degree. And that self-assessment I spoke about earlier, that self-evaluation, mm -hmm. that annual report, that needs to be part of that consideration, because I would say that's a weakness, uh, and it's a weakness we've identified previously. Jane? And the only thing I'd add to, 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 to that is to um, maybe request that um, a representative of the service comes along and helps us, because um, it's all very fine and dandy for us to be talking about internal audit and you've had a go at it, but it will be, I think, very useful to be able to speak to the relevant responsible member of the service at the same time when we have a, an update. I think that's absolutely appropriate. It's something we may lack on. Stephen, then, if we can come to a conclusion, that'll be good. Um, I, I mean, I would yeah, truly agree. Uh, in fact, I was just sort of in, bearing in mind the first uh, thing to do with delegations where you're saying there's almost like a the summary of the work that's been done to date since, um, you know, over the last few years, in a way this helps build and add to that because you can then see, well, yeah, these have been initiated, that's at the wash-up stage, We're going, you know, and then you can see that kind of uh, progression. Um, but the other thing was, do we need to have a special uh, regard for the potential governance uh, arrangements around pension, use of pension funds, etc.? Because obviously there's, there's a lot of things being captured as maybe actions or things to be followed up, but I think that one's a kind of... Kind of um, goes to the heart of something else, uh, really, you know, which should be maybe captured fully in the recommendations, I think. Well, all I was going to suggest is that um, you and I could maybe write to the chairman of the pension board and, uh, and, and say that this has come to our notice and that maybe they might like to take notice of this particular report. It would be help helpful for us to simply say that we we consider that they would be interested in it. So up to them as a separate body. And I must admit, as a trustee, I think I'd be livid. <laughs> I just, so just come back to previous practice, John, before you come in. So should we take a view in the gas? Because previously there was a three million pound black hole appeared, so to speak, within the road, road budget stroke, Franz Evan and all the rest of it. We look into all the detail of that. So the chair and the vice chair wrote, which I might pick up in a minute, they wrote to the chair of the Economy, Environment Infrastructure Committee. Subsequently, there's been a, an investigation progress uh, process. That'll come to a conclusion. So that could possibly have the same effect that we raised, but have we, we had a clear view in, at that point. So do we have a view around the table say that we think this is inappropriate? I don't know if we've had a level of information presented to us in front of us, because, like I said, there's maybe a like, conflict, because Section 8 officer, 95 officer has said to me, it is appropriate, but actually, there's still a level of concern uh, from an internal auditor, so it's it's so should we just alert John? But you want to come in, and then I'll bring you. Did you bring John yeah, in for a quick bit? Maybe it's a bit late to declare an interest as vice chair of the pension subcommittee, but uh, no, uh, the pensions uh, subcommittee has never been aware of any you know uh, this type of uh, transaction taking place. There was discussion, if I can remember, way back in 2017, uh, that we, we, the council could possibly use some of the pension fund, but I think that was proper investment, not, not the money that sits in waiting to be invested. This is actual money that's already been invested, uh, in, say, for, for instance, property and stuff like that, you know, whether we could... Uh, you know, invest in that type of thing. But uh, I, I, I think uh, the general view at that time was it really depends on the returns. I would imagine that the council, if they want to borrow money from the pension fund, they, would, they will not be want to give the, the same level of return that we find ourselves in other sort of investments. So, and, and I think it was sort of left at that. But uh, there has been certainly no mention about uh, investment at the time. But simply to say that the referral of that issue to the pensions panel will be done as part of implementing this report. The internal audit will be tailing the Section 95 officer. This is something that should be taken forward. 
with the, the pension. Do we as a committee have a view, I suppose, is the point I was getting to. Uh, Councillor McKee then, Thompson. Well, at the, at the end of the day, the pension, pension fund can uh, let you know what the regulations are concerning oh. that. Not end of story. Yeah. Yeah. We could argue here all day about it. Yeah. I, I think you're right. It's just a point. Bring it to a conclusion because it's been brought up. As, is this a particular point in, in, this, in regards to governance? So, Stephen, you want to last? We were doing. We'll just move on. Just to, is there something else that needs to go to the review of the standing orders and scheme of delegation? To, to, because we need to, evidently this is, the, there's the, no. what will come from the pensions um, side of things and then there's actually, this was a council decision to do this, not a pensions thing to do this, it seems. And I'm not really sure how practically you could have an arrangement whereby like, yeah, if you need this over the weekend, you're not going to get a meeting of the pensions subcommittee to determine that. No, no, no. This was like a short-term fix type of thing, you know. So, I, you know, I'm not sure that the changes we're potentially talking about would actually capture this type of a short-term thing. And like, you know, anyway, let's. I, I know. I mean, the thing that's why. So, so, aye, so, so section 85 officer sits in the pension committee and it gives the pension committee the financial advice. The same, very same officer uh, advised me this morning, but it's second hand. We're giving this fair enough. So you maybe need to hear it from the horse's mouth if it's so important that actually it was. Appropriate and under the circumstances, you've received the council, the pension fund will have received a benefit through interest and it was very low risk, it was very, very short term. It, it probably wasn't as much of a convenience as anything else. Uh, but do we have a consent? Do we have a, do, I mean, ultimately, when we're looking at this from a, a risk point of view, what, what was the risk? That's what we have to fundamentally look at. Robert Maxwell was mentioned earlier. I think, okay, if we're a private organisation, like so that, dealing in such a way, but we're only taking three, we're taking 500 million rather than half the portion of it sitting in that, that fund, then there is the risk. That's the kind of fund you were talking about previously. But I think in the short term, we just need to be able to, I think we need to be able to refer mm -hmm. this. It will be, get picked up through the, 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 the scheme of delegation to officers and there's an action there. But ultimately, do, do we have a particular view? That's the point I'm trying to assess for us. Do we think it's appropriate? If somebody is sitting in the pension committee, somebody has done it, it's probably more appropriate. I think that we maybe leave it there in the pension committee. We get the reassurance that the mm -hmm. com pension committee stroke board. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they actually become aware of this, and then they, they can say, they, they'll decide the pension fund strategy. Mm -hmm. They will decide that, no us. So, okay, one small point, Katie. Then we'll move on. Thank you, Chair. It's just really for clarity, because you know we're looking at risk here. And could you clarify for me the Section 95 officer sits on the board of the pension and advises the pension board, but also advises the council. So, is there not a risk in so far that that one person is advising? both parties, if we're separating, because one organisation board of a second, and you know, if the same person is advising both bodies, surely there's a risk in that. There may and well be, Kate, but I'm just wondering if it's appropriate in this particular meeting today, because there may well be a risk there. I would imagine it's low level. I'm not going to uh, make any assumptions in regards to that or advice, but I think, so there may well be, but what we're considering today is the transaction. That's a particular point we're talking about. This transaction that took place, but I think we have to stick to that eye. Yeah. Did the same person advise both bodies? I, well, I okay. we, so, so I think so that, that is a risk if you've got one person. It absolutely, it is a risk. You're 100 percent right. But is, are we considering this today? We know we would need a, a further report to get into that meet and gravy, so to speak, that level of detail. Uh, and I think we haven't got information in front of us today, so it may well be something we we'll consider. We feel like it, it can sort of, through a scrutiny review, go back to the tools so that we've got in our toolbox the mechanisms that we can use. It's not something I think we can take any great value of today, but in a future report, we may well. Thanks for raising that point. So we've captured in regard to recommendations. So the recommendations are very, very light. Members are asked to note and comment on the internal audit, audit reports finalised. So we need to reconfigure that. Uh, so that will be under paragraph 2. There will be a 2.1, so which should reflect, I think, the members are asked to note and consider the comment, uh, note and comment sorry, uh, on the internal audit reports finalised. We have 2.2, uh, looking for a bit of help and advice in regards to that. I think we've covered a couple of things. In yes, regards I, to I think that the issue that I said about the format of internal audit reports in the future um, being more explicit about the recommendations and with regard to the three financial reports you've received today, general concerns about compliance across financial systems and also seeking information about training. I think you're right, there was three things. Four, four were considered and we had points on all four because the leader programme was in there as well. But there was three, three financial ones, fair enough. I think it was comments made in them all. It was about get, predominantly about getting the reassurances in regards to the conclusions, the actions would be reported back to us and would 
ability to uh, feed into that, either be satisfied or make recommendations back to the appropriate department, so on and so forth. Stephen? So are we, are we agreeing as a second recommendation to receive reports back on um, the individual items yet? So, but I wonder what... Aye, but I wonder, just, just, just on these four particular, I think maybe we'll make clear within the recommendations, so 2.1 would be as, as is within the paper, 2.2 to receive a report back on, on, you on, on, on receive, the discussion. Yeah. You, you do, as part of your remit, receive an update and a progress report on the internal audits where you've had recommendations, so you will you will get um, these update reports next year. Yeah. So are we satisfied it's next year, we haven't got a defined timeline that we do receive, we will receive it, are we satisfied that's the case, or do we want to see it at a particular time, sooner rather than later? What's our view, John? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it uh, makes reference to that in 3.5 and page 21. The audits will be followed up in due course and any outstanding issues will be reported back to the committee. So, Kevin, you've made up a timeline that, have you? Thank you, Chair. Yes. What, what we've been providing, we've been trying to provide a follow-up report, the, the two types of follow-up reports. Follow-up reports for things like the purchase card um, would be after six months. And the format of that report, it is a while since you've had one of those, but the format of that report is we do a summary of the report, we identify the key issues emerging either you know, from discussions with management or discussions at the committee, and then we get management to give us a specific response on what they've done. So that, that format has been quite successful. You've seen that. For main financial systems work, what we do is we do a follow-up the following year and that as part of our controls assurance exercise. So in other words, going forward, I produce a controls assurance statement on an annual basis. That includes, that draws on work done that year on main financial systems and also it includes the follow-up on previous year's financial systems as well. So in the normal course of events, you'd be getting feedback on uh, payroll and pensions as part of that report, mm -hmm. and that's what I'd propose we do. It will, I'll discuss with Liz, you know, we'll probably have to listen to the discussion again in terms of if there are specific points emerging today about specific aspects, then I'd find another way to take those forward, starting with drawing them to the attention of management. Just if I can briefly, I'm sorry, make a comment about the reports, the style of the reports. This style of report that you've been getting today is different from what we had in the past. And this style of report was specifically pitched to try and obtain better engagement from management. In effect, the, the posit behind them, I'm not being defensive, I, I appreciate the comments being made today. We will broadly reach the same conclusions ourselves. But the, the posit in the presentation was to say, we will identify against the set of parameters, success or failure, put that to management and ask them to respond to that. That's what that back section of the report is supposed to be, management's response. Unfortunately, it's proved to be the case that management have not engaged by using that. In the normal course of events, I'd have expected there to be much fuller responses. Where we've said management have accepted the report, that basically means we didn't get a response from management on it, okay? So that's why it's weak, that's why it's poor, and that's the fundamental problem we, we're facing at this time. We've not got the engagement from management on the report. If we move to a system where we make specific recommendations, it is easier for management to respond on those specific things, but it also lacks certain, you know, it's, it's a 2D response rather than a 3D response. So the whole philosophy behind the current reports that you've been looking at has been to try and hook management and get them to talk to us better and to, if you like, say, we could handle this, but and this is how we'd propose to deal with this, but this one would need longer or whatever, rather than us making specific pointed recommendations. But it's clear that there's dissatisfaction, there's dissatisfaction on our part too with this, there's dissatisfaction at the committee, and I think management would find it a lot easier if they've got a specific thing to do. So we'll move back, we're already starting a different type of report different format for the report where we'll go back to making specific recommendations around specific issues and that you're, the next set of reports that you'll get in April will reflect that that approach so I'm, I'm you know as I said, I'm not being defensive please don't interpret this as being being defensive it was an attempt to get better engagement and it kind of hasn't worked so we'll go back to saying right here's some specific issues emerging from this thanks for that Kevin I'm pretty reassured. Councillor McKee then, we'll just move just on. Just a quickie, stage. Chair. Is it unrealistic to expect a three-month report on the cash cards? 
given a concern we've expressed. So what, what we've actually looked, what, I, so what we've looked at is well, apparently it's coming back. We'll get updates to these reports in April, from what I can see here. Is no, that right? No. This is six months. Yeah. June. June. Okay. So June. June. What you'll get in April. So, so, aye. Okay, <laughs> right. So, so the update to these these reports here will we'll, we'll, we'll get in in June. And it, the one would, given yeah. given the concern we expressed on the cash cards, is it unrealistic to just get a progress report on what's happening with regards to cash cards? Then I want a final decision, but let us know what they're doing towards eradicating all the problems. I wonder then if we can capture this. So, because of the level of discussion we've had on it today, uh, and it is like I say, we're, we're kind of learning as we go forward here. But I think it's appropriate that maybe we capture this and we've got to have a workshop. Uh, so this type of stuff will capture. And the same with the, the new format. Do we have a, an individual report or do we? So rather than, we'll, we'll kind of leave it there. So all this stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a discussion point in an informal uh, setting and we'll capture it there. So we'll leave the recommendations as there with the assurances that we've got, we've got the information come back to us in April and June and the report and format and the points that you're picking up, Jordan. We may even have a, a, a verbal update briefing at that point in the to get reassurances around about the cards. Excellent. Item number seven. Thanks very much. Thank you. So the arrangements for assessing internal audits, conformance with professional standards. I don't know why I wrote Grant Thornton with a question mark. Maybe that'll be when it comes to that as an external organisation. But I suppose you'll want to say a few words to this, Kevin, will you? Um, just general context, Chair. This has been referenced before to the committee, but obviously we have some new members since that time. The audit charter, which was approved by the committee in February as part of the audit plan for uh, the current year, um, sort of sets out. That was rewritten to demonstrate a clear conformance with professional standards. So we do need an external assessment of some kind done. And this report is really advising what those arrangements will be going forward. So. Thank you. Any, any particular points, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, it seems fairly straightforward and happy to go with the recommendations. It was just a point three point three. Uh, I know we want to get into the Christmas feeling, um, but uh, so I was just wondering about the internal audit manger. Um, I presume that's a typo. It's a festive typo, I think. But three point three, page fifty one. It's been the internal audit manager's recommendation. Uh, I know. I picked that myself. I managers. There's a name missing. I know. We did pick up. Sorry, I was looking at three point two. I thought it was three point two. But we did. No, I did. I did pick up at that myself. But I just give it a typo. Do so. In regards to so, and we're leaving it at three point six, uh, to less in real terms to make sure that's dealt with. Everybody happy enough with that? We are item number eight. Thank you, Kevin. So item number eight is scrutiny reviews forward program. Who's got to talk to this, Liz? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I understand that over the, the last um, year or so that you have identified a number of possible topics for scrutiny reviews. And so at 3.4, we have identified the ones that um, political groupings have identified perhaps as their priority suggestions for the year ahead. So what we're looking for you to do today is to identify perhaps um, three or four that you would like to do in the year ahead, ideally prioritise them, and then we would have the workshops where we develop the, the actual brief in a wee bit more detail, who you want to interview, what particular aspects it is that you want to look at, and then we'll follow your normal um, process which is set out in the scrutiny handbook. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, John and Jock. John and Jock. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I was looking at the list on page 59 there, and two or three of them sort of popped out. One uh, at the top there is community asset transfers. That might be a good one. We seem to be getting into a right old muddle with one or two uh, community asset transfers at the moment, so maybe we can look at some to make the process a little bit easier. Uh, Town Centre Living Fund was another one that I picked up, and energy usage, you know, now that we've uh, declared an 
a climate emergency, but that's all right. So it's not those ones. Sorry, Chair. Is it just the ones in page three? Uh, no, no, that's right. No, sir. No. Sorry, Jane. It's all right, Lisa. It's we're, we're so, so, we're absolutely, so we've got an appendix, and right. we've, we've, we've that's got. That's what I thought. Chair. Kate is uh, leading me down the wrong path. Here. Oh, that's it. No, so right. we've got. Uh, it's absolutely. What we're trying to do, all these ones that we've got, we'll look to prioritise some. You now, yeah. we can either do it here today, and this is something we're going to say, or we'll look at the different approach. We're going to get it at the workshop, we're going to actually finalise it there and consider them all, or we can bring them up today and actually say, okay, absolutely, we've got a number of different options, and there is more than one way in which to deal with these, because it's 3.6, I think it is, it tells us about the, the, the structure we're putting in place, but there's maybe potentially a fast track approach we could take as well. I think we'll have to, I've certainly for one of, one of the ones that I'd like to do, I'd like a fast track, I think it's quite a simple quick in-out piece of work over over two committee cycles. So we get in, do the workshops, and we'll back, report back, and get back to full council, get it done. So I think it's everything. Everything, everything's open. Even new options, kind of new ideas, John. It, we're, we're not restricted to these. That, that, that's what I thought, Chair. But uh, those are three that stick out for, for me, but I'm happy to listen to other members. Perhaps for them. We have Councillor McKee, then Maitland, then Graham. Hi, thanks, Chair. I was going on page 55, actually. Um, outcomes, and I didn't, actually, I didn't see them on the appendix. It's outcomes achieved from a council's investment in public social partnership on community transport and the provision to health and social care with particular focus on the reasons for delayed discharges. Excellent job. Thank you for that, Jane. Um, I, I take your point, um, Chairman, with respect to um, you know, some of these might be actually doable really quite quickly. Um, um, and, and it don't, wouldn't necessarily take a, a sort of full six month process to, to get them all, all finished. Um, I, I think on that basis, um, the business support services for elected members, um, that's a, a kind of it, it, it's about assisting us to do our job properly, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to put in. Um, so I, I would like to see that that happen. Um, I think it doesn't need to be that drawn out. I think we can just do a quick run round about what we know other other people do, other people have, and whether or not it is actually appropriate or sustainable, or et cetera, et cetera, what's the right thing to do. Um, so um, I'm quite happy to see that one come forward. Um, I, um, I, I think also the community asset transfer issue could also be done quite quickly as well. Um, I, I don't think that's a really complex um, issue. The, the health and social care, um, the, um, the health and social care ma management um, is much wider, but we're doing a bit of work through um, the through all internal audit. And, and I think there's an argument to say that we, we want to know if services are actually integrating properly. And I think we need to perhaps consider it. If, if this has come through the, um, the, the groupings and the groups and the administration that we wish to see um, um, the, the, uh, the, the workings of health and social care, and somebody's picked particularly on delayed discharges because that maybe is what is politically worrying. Um, I think maybe we should look at how we can get at that. Now we might take a decision and in fact that's being done through the IJB or the risk committee itself and that we should then receive an information directly from them. That's another way of looking at it. But but I think that is something that we perhaps should take forward. So, that. Thank you very much. Council Bell, Graham. Chair, sure, there's quite a big list in the appendix here in 59 and that obviously, you know, Councillor Campbell and Councillor Maitland have touched on community asset transfers. I think that needs to be handled pretty quickly. And that it's a it's a sort of hot subject I'm getting with constituents yeah. across my ward and North Eastern Fries. Uh, are always talking about community asset transfer. Also, as well as um, the town centre living fund. And I would say, from my point of view, uh, the ward working arrangements. I, I, I do I feel that the ward worker is necessary uh, to uh, across working across the the various wars across the region. So there's a number of points here, but I think the community asset transfers needs to be fairly high in the priority list at the moment. Right, so we'll cut to the chase. Uh, I think, this, can, can we delegate this actual decision in regards to the, the, the views that we take forward, the particular 
uh, the, I think there's another tier level information probably could be added to this, whether it's health so, so scale, whether it's a uh, community asset transfer, or whether it's the uh, the, the level of uh, resource allocated to, to members of the council and how that applies, and a whole raft of all these other things. Let's not take anything off the table. Let's be open to further ideas as well, and a workshop sometime in the third or fourth week of January, something like that, and we'll discuss these whole matters and get done, but we'll we'll decide at that point. Is everybody content with that? Well, Ch Chairman, actually, no, I'd really like to pin down what we're doing today. I think we've probably got to be brave and say what can and cannot be done um, uh, and, uh, and really start the process going. Um, so, um, I mean, a starter for, for 10 would be, I think we've already, if Liz has got right, we've got the, the um, community asset transfers has been mentioned by three members, Town Centre Living Fund, couple of people, um, and um, I think the other one that we're looking for is support, is that right? And social care. So those, those are the four things, I think, which have come forward. Put that on as well, then, David. We'll just put that on. I mean, that's the uh, end, I think. Yeah. So, so, so we could define them. Still have a workshop to bottom them out, the level of detail. Do we want a short-term, do, do we want a long-term yeah. approach? Depend on... And there may well be options that we think, okay, we'll put this to the, to the February or April committee for further consideration. So we have prioritised for what I can hear. Well, you may be over it, but business, business support services for elected members. Uh, the business support services for elected members, the outcomes from the public social partnership, health and social care, and community asset, asset transfers transfer. and town centre living fund. fund. Yep. And what we can do for your workshop is bring you an outline scope what you might like to look at, um, who you might like to interview in a proposed time scale, and then you can have a look at that and decide whether or not the, the, perhaps the priority and whether or not you want to go ahead with all of these. So what Liz has just said, they will capture at recommendation 2.1. Is that okay? So we'll just change that. So the decision will be that. And 2.2, obviously, schedule undertaking. So we'll, we'll pick it up through a workshop. Okay, thank you very much. Can I, Kate, sorry, Kate, can yep. I just ask, in terms of the ward working arrangements that were were mentioned there. Could that be captured as part of the business support for elected members? Absolutely could. I think there's a clear correlation between the two. I, I believe there is a correlation. Forward. Yep. Yep. No, it is. And we'll get that through the workshop. Okay. There is a correlation between the two. How much direct support do you get via that? So item number nine is a health and safety progress report. And here we have, oh, I've been told it's the 18 to present this. Is that correct? Yes. We have Sue White and Stuart Clanahan. So I don't know who's leading. Is it yourself? Is it yourself? Whoever's leading, have you got any? So it's yourself, Sue, that's leading in regards to this. So the purpose of this report uh, is to provide members with a performance progress update on the corporate health and safety activities against the corporate health and safety plan for 16 to 19. Uh, so we get to the end of this one. There'll be a new one needing to be refreshed and reviewed, I would imagine, shortly, uh, up to October. So this is between October and March, October 18 to March 19. Sue, over to you. Have you got anything either to add? Or whatever. Just happy to take any questions. Uh, any points particularly you want to pick out or not? Tell us how bad our selected members have been in regards to. Sorry. <laughs> um, you would obviously know there's an increase in um, Rudor incidents and violence this year. Um, and it's areas where the, the areas um, that are of risk are subject to working groups. Um, within the council to review. Um, I was at the um, uh, Scottish Personnel Director Society yesterday with colleague local authorities um, and done Fries and Galloway just to say that we're not alone. It seems to be every other Scottish local authority has similarly seen um, an increase in violence for, uh, across the uh, education. And it's something I think the Scottish Government have, have, are even asking the local authorities to, and we're trying to work together with them to see if we can, um, you know, make some improvements on this. And also within education themselves, uh, I've got a, a lead in a working group um, to try and progress actions in this area. Thank you, Sue. Thanks for that. So it comes to Hagman. Katie, you're first. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking for reassurance that the information we've got before us is actually accurate. And the reason for me asking that is on page 67, it mentions percentage of elected members who have undertaken health and safety responsibilities training. Now, there was a 
note in my diary about a month ago for a health and safety training. I, nobody else seemed to have it. I phoned up and said, look, is this happening? And then eventually I got a call saying, no, actually it's been cancelled because members haven't agreed to come along. At which point I said, but I've done the health and safety training. I did it in Newton Stewart. And I got a, no, you haven't. It's not on your record. There's no record of that. No, you definitely haven't done it. And I, my, you know, the conversation was, no, I definitely did do it. It was, I've, I've actually found the note in my diary. But I'm just looking for reassurance that the information that's been captured is actually the correct information. Because certainly when I spoke to someone about my own personal record, they had no recollection of me, or they had no record of me doing the training when I had actually had. So, I guess it's reassurance. Just for reassurance, the information I used was my own information, and I was the trainer, and so I've been able to use that information directly for myself, so I can confirm. It's actually 11 out of 15 have attended training. If you're looking at the latest um, audit and risk committee, the, the latest, if we're just not looking at all the elected members, but if we're looking at members of the latest membership of this committee, 11 out of 15 have in fact attended the training um, and seven was last year and four was previous years before that um, but we welcome um, welcome any suggestions for how that training wants to be delivered to try and encourage more elected members because it is definitely something that I know as part of full council as part of induction training for members we are definitely trying to um, encourage and make it mandatory for health and safety training for elected members, um, you know, to make yourselves aware of what the management arrangements are in the council for health and safety, um, and also your own personal legal health and safety responsibilities so that you are absolutely, you know, um, aware of those as well, um, as well as um, any other topics that you would like us. We, we have found in the past, and I think it's about um, Katie, that, that the training does actually involve quite a lot of discussion, um, health and healthy discussion, and it does give the elected members an opportunity for that. I just put on the question. I just thought about enjoying it. I'd, I've done it twice. Can that apply to somebody else in my group? Is <laughs> 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 there a transfer of skills there, John? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, you know setting up of a health and safety work group. You know, looking into uh, you know. Uh, assaults and teachers and things like that. Now, uh, I would imagine that we've already got some kind of policy in place for that. So uh, why, why are we having to set up, you know, a work group to look into something that's already, you know, there should be something in place is basically my question. Um, the, with the same with any arrangements they need reviewing from time to time and because of the increase in violence obviously under further scrutiny um so um and, and it's likewise not just for this council as i say but a, across the board um particular hot spot schools for example not just in the working group but they've got the um learn um, the learning support experience learning support um manager going in to actually review at a local level what you know what's happening to review for for improvement um, at, at various levels uh, from an organisational basis within education and locally within a school. I don't think I've got anybody else coming in at this moment in time. Just a quickie, Chair. Is it time expired or training? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've been asked to review uh, the overall summary of performance of the Corporate Health and Safety Plan for the period October 1st October 18 to March 31st of this year, paragraphs 3, 1 to 3, 16, and as per the appendices and the scrutinised exception report, and that's been in as per appendix 2. Are we content that we've done that? Okay, right, thank you. The next report is item number 10, which is a membership of the Joint Safety Committee. Obviously, it's clearly outlined within that that there's been a change of the committee membership. This has to be refreshed, I think, is it five or six? Six members. So do we want to do that now or do, do we need to do that right now or do we need to, if we're up for it, I mean, have we got members lined up or, or do, obviously, ideally from this committee, they'll have to come from, do we have members come, uh, lined up? Uh, is it on a proportionate basis or not? To, no. What would it be? No, so it's carte blanche. So, Jane? I can say, I, I mean, I think sort of, what have we got to do? How many how many people were on it? I know that Councillor Howie was on it. So, so, so there was six. So, so, I mean, I'm on it as well, so I imagine, Ian, I think Karen's on it. She wanted to stay on it. 
if possible. Obviously, we've got a different membership, so it's up for discussion, and it's uh, almost 50-50. Uh, it almost, it's close to being 50-50, so should it be from three from each, or that's probably the point I'm getting to. Stephen? Uh, well, I, I suppose firstly, it's like how many of the existing members are still on it that want to stay on, because obviously there's maybe the odd vac vacancy effectively in the membership. I mean, I'm not sure if with that, pre it'd be nice to have representation from each of the groups, for example, but I mean, I, I, you know, I think the nature I, of the committee is such, it's probably, you know... Um, I don't know if you've, uh, have you had a chance to, I mean, Council Driver's not here, he used to be the health and safety man of the Council full stop, I don't know if you've had a discussion beforehand, because he's not here, doesn't mean to... Either that or we, we, we appoint on a, on a, on a, on a proportionate basis, I know I'm quite happy to stay on, others, so I'm still on it in real terms, but ultimately happy to look at a complete refresh if, that, if that's what the committee uh, desires. <laughs> Councillor Howley, so Councillor Howley's keen to stay on, I heard there, yeah, I'm sure I heard. I uh, know Councillor Crothers is as well, Karen, uh, is, she's keen. So that'd be three, fit, certainly from this side. Malcolm, have you got a view in regards to that? I know, that's fine, that's fine. We'll, go, we'll get it up. I mean, I think, let's, if we can be proportionate. I'd, no, did you see what we on, Jane? No. I'm, I'm just saying that, that I'm quite sure that Councillor Howie would give way where, where oh, no. somebody else is desperate to it. So Councillor Drivers are number four, I think yeah, it is, is it? You just yeah. need one more. Yeah. So Stephen Thompson. Thompson. Oh, I, of course. So, well, so one more, Councillor Stephen. Thompson. Well done. You like it. You like it. It's really good. We we uh, uh, committee. So it is. It's and we, we, we've got an informal arrangement. So if they pick up any particular safety problems, they refer them up to us. So the whole committee actually gets to see them. So you get good, good discussion there. I've, uh, no, in regards to any other business, I'm going to take advice first, uh, and so you can all hear this. So I think there should be another, another meeting sometime, maybe early part of February, in the first two weeks. So because of the level of business, the workshop before that will discuss that. Is that something we can discuss and arrange out with the committee, or do we need to make that? Sorry. Well, is that something, or should we, should we get any other company of business and make a clear decision here? We would like to have another, uh, so it's from the committee itself, we'd like to have another meeting uh, sometime in February, ideally the first fortnight. So there's no no requirement for that to be a decision, but certainly could be a minute to request for another meeting in February, if that's what you would request. Everybody okay with that? Either, I mean, ultimately, I think through the chair and vice chair we could call that meeting, but, mm -hmm. but I think it... If the whole committee wants it, we can have it as an action request from the committee ourselves. Okay, from the committee ourselves. Yep. John? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, ultimately, we've got a workshop the last two weeks of January, and that will feed into that first meeting. So if we Otherwise, we're waiting from then until April, and we've got scrutiny reviews. We think it'll be in out, done and dusted, uh, jokes. So I think, I mean, I'd really keen to see one in the beginning of February. Some of it in the first fortnight of February. And it'll not be a long one. No, it'll not be a long one. No, it'll be a later, later right. agenda. We'll look, talk look, about scrutiny yeah, reviews. Look, look in the diary for February, Ian. Look in the diary for February. Get in quick, because there's a couple of empty weeks. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. So we've agreed as a way forward, we'll, have, we'll call a meeting then. Thank you, capture that. Thanks very much. No, no further business. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Johnston. Oh, it's, just, it's just a small, it's more, more like a kind of discussion point, really, as much as anything else. I mean, we all quite clearly want to get reports coming back. And I sometimes wonder with some of these meetings why we can't get interim reports without having to go through all this committee structure. Why can't we get an email update, you know, prior to the time, so we so that we keep abreast of what's happening, rather than wait for... Pardon? Can, can we pick that up in the workshop, Malcolm, do you think? Is that Aye, a particular okay. item? I just Aye. think, because we get a full discussion. No, I don't mean that, I don't mean that, I just mean... Aye. Can you put that in the list? In the workshop. So, so, so we've picked that particular point up in, in the part of the, the workshop, Malcolm, and we'll pick that up. So, okay, interme intermediate briefings in regards to subject matters that we feel is important in particular. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you all. You. Cheers. Anyone? Thank you.